Hello everyone, I'm John Akers and I've been a town planner for almost 50 years. I was president of the RTPI in 2018 and have twice been chairman of the West Midlands RTPI branch. So welcome to the first episode of the RTPI West Midlands International Group's new video series, Rebuilding Out of Conflict. Throughout the next year, we'll be examining 12 different European cities, exploring the question of how we can rebuild cities out of conflict, whilst remaining sensitive to their past and the role of planning in this. Today, in celebration of the Coventry City of Culture launching on the 15th of May, we'll be focusing on Coventry. Now, most of you will know that Coventry, along with other cities like Hull, Plymouth and Southampton, were very badly bombed during the Blitz in 1940, and particularly during the air raid on the night of the 14th of November 1940, when much of the city, including the old cathedral, St Michael's, the library, the market hall, and many of the old medieval streets and shops were razed to the ground. I used to live in Napton 25 years ago in South Warwickshire and the older residents there recalled seeing the bombers flying over the hill on the way to Coventry to drop their bombs. And over 11 hours, nearly 500 Luftwaffe bombers were dropped. More than 43,000 homes were lost in that raid. The church tower and the ruins now stand as a symbol of resilience and I'm proud to say that I've rang the bells in that church tower. So it's my pleasure to welcome Peter Larkham, Professor of Planning at Birmingham City University School of Engineering and Built Environment. Welcome Peter. So Peter, what was the nature of the conflict that affected Coventry? Well, this was the Second World War. It's a local element of what was nearly a worldwide conflict. But we ought to think that actually it was very early in that war. So aircraft were fewer and they were smaller than in the later raids on Germany and the Japan. So if we look at what happened to Coventry itself, you had something like 800 tonnes of bombs dropped in two major air raids. Major is usually defined as over 100 aircraft. And although that sounds bad and it was awful for the people who suffered through it, compare that to the County of London, 18,000 tonnes of bombs and 1,800 in Birmingham itself. Now, in response to the damage, after a lot of toing and froing between the city and the government, um, there was a process known as a declaratory order, which basically declared officially that a certain area was damaged. And that's important because it led to the ability to claim uh, from the War Damages Commission. In other words, who's gonna pay to repair some of this damage? And for Coventry, we ended up with 274 acres of war damage over 4,000 destroyed houses. Now that's just about a thousand less than the official figure for Birmingham itself. And it's about equal with the cities of Portsmouth, Southampton and Hull. So that gives us a bit of an idea about what happened and how that might compare to other cities in this country that were damaged. So Peter, was there a plan for rebuilding? Well, the problem of thinking about a plan is that like many of these damaged towns and cities, there ended up being multiple plans. And it's also worth mentioning for Coventry that in 1938, the city council had appointed a new young radical left-wing architect called Donald Gibson to be the city's first city architect. Now Gibson recruited an equally young and radical team for his new department. At least one of those was a card carrying member of the Communist Party. This is Percy Johnson Marshall, and in fact, the archive of 
Edinburgh University, where he ended his career, still has his communist membership card. Now this team very quickly prepared a new vision for the city centre and held a big public exhibition in 1940. This was before the bombing raids itself. So clearly, even before the damage, they were thinking that the city centre really needed a lot done to it. Now, interestingly and very rarely, the visitor comments book for that exhibition still survives and it has some very interesting responses from members of the public. One of them said the scheme would certainly be a vast improvement over the present state of affairs. It's long overdue. Coventry could do with replanning. But on the other hand, others were saying, well, it's a bit too ambitious. It's all right to make models of it, but to carry out the plans is a bit more difficult. Now, after the damage of the raids and tidying it up, removing all the rubble, the council asked Gibson himself and the long established city engineer called Ernest Ford to prepare plans. So what you got was Gibson's still very radical modernist plan and Ford's really rather more conservative plan. But I think the clash between these two has been a bit overemphasized in a lot of the histories. But we ended up with a lot of alternative plans, not just those two, but even things like the local Chamber of Commerce produced a plan using F.W. Woolworth's um, corporate architects. But in the end, we ended up with an agreed plan. So basically, Gibson and Ford had their heads knocked together a little bit. Um, this was promoted by the City Council straight after the war. There was another big public exhibition and it was finally approved by the Ministry, although not without some really rather critical comments. But even the Ministry recognised that um, this is a bit unfair on Coventry because it had taken them years to respond to the original plan. And so we ended up in the late 1940s with a reconstruction plan, just at the same time that we had a new 1947 Town and Country Planning Act, which really said, we've got a new system, wipe it all out, start planning again. What was the nature of the rebuilding? In other words, was it a case of retaining broadly the same street pattern and trying to reproduce what was there before? Or was it about starting afresh with the new layout and modern architecture? Well, pretty nearly starting afresh, partly because of the concentration of the bomb damage itself. And because Gibson's plans from that pre air raid exhibition really were sweep it all away and start again. This was a, an agenda of making it more modern, more functional and workable. Changing the land uses, the building forms, looking again at pedestrian and vehicle circulation and doing this for as much of the city core as could be afforded. Problem in a medieval city like Coventry was it did have a lot of historic buildings and quite a lot of them survived even the bombing. But at the time they were seen as being in the way. And so we ended up by simply removing some of them to the edge of the city centre in Spon Street. And so Ford's Hospital, which was bombed, about a third of it was actually destroyed, was seen as something of an unnecessary problem. In fact, Gibson said, here is a building whose sole value is historic. Should it be allowed to stand in the way of the new plan? And even by about 1952, the government's chief inspector of ancient monuments wrote about Gibson. And he said, it's quite clear that the Coventry planner, who's a malignant, has paid no attention at all to ancient monuments because he dislikes them. So you can see the building up a lot of toing and froing between central government planning and heritage organisations and the city and its city architect and engineers. But I suppose like a lot of other places like Plymouth and Exeter, most of the new architect was very plain, partly because of cost reasons and because of 
restrictions on building material that were rationed until the mid 1950s. So perhaps a lot of what was built seemed unusually radical and modernist. So concrete and flat roofs were in the fashion. But so was public art. And we had new building forms such as the circular market hall and the very unfamiliar and certainly not Gothic space of the new cathedral. And we also had innovations such as dealing with the problem of car parking by using some of those flat roofs. But one of our problems now is that we're judging these really radical and quite interesting things by today's standards with our bigger and heavier cars, for example. So, Peter, how long did the process all take? Well, the problem with all reconstruction is it will take as long as you can afford. And it didn't really start until the late 1940s because of these delays in approving the plan. And as I said, building material, including structural steel, was rationed until 1954 and it was allocated by a cabinet committee, no less. And in fact, the need to generate money for the country from overseas sales in those early post-war periods, we know this in the car industry, meant that building steel was allocated as a priority for overseas sales. So it was quite difficult to get things started. And in Coventry, like all of our other bomb cities, the process was really quite slow to start, even though the national government said that Coventry was a flagship, a demonstration project. So I suppose things really only got going in the late 1950s and the 1960s. So at the time there was some public unrest at slow progress. But when things did get going, they inevitably involved more demolition of property that wasn't bombed in the war, especially for things like road improvements. So there was more unrest when things did get going. Um, but actually, virtually everything came to a halt in 1973 because we had an oil crisis, a Middle East war. And so that reconstruction period was relatively short. So mid to late 50s until that sudden end in 1973. So what has happened since? Has the rebuilding needed to be revised? or has it stood the test of time? Well, some things have changed. So, for example, traffic has grown enormously. Think about congestion. Think about the rising demand for car parking. That very innovative rooftop parking provision wasn't followed in many other places. And our cars are much bigger, more powerful, faster. So roads, and access ramps built to 1940 standards seem very tight, very inadequate. So that's a problem in terms of the longevity of these things. But well, let's let's look to the future. Will new transport innovations like driverless cars take us back to smaller and fewer vehicles? One of the other things that happened was subdividing Coventry into precincts and that controls vehicle movement. And that's probably been a good thing. It's helped us to prioritise pedestrians and to pedestrianise spaces. But on the other hand, you could argue that strict pedestrianisation is quite restrictive. So perhaps looking forward, we should consider more shared spaces. And that's very common in European historic town centres. What's also changing is retailing. So from the 1980s, we've got the rise of edge of town and out of town shopping centres. And so Coventry, as with anywhere else, we've had vacant stores, lots of charity shops and so on in that rebuilt town centre. And that's not a direct result of the rebuilding, but of a structural change in how, what and where we shop. So the more recent rise of online shopping spurred, of course, in the last year by COVID, will be an even greater challenge for both the traditional and the post-war rebuilt high streets. So for Coventry, actually, I think a lot of the ideas of reconstruction have stood the test of time. But as retailing has changed, the investment and maintenance has diminished. 
that rebuilt city centre has become less attractive, even shabby. And as the pro-conservation movement has risen from the 1970s, there's been quite a reaction against unfamiliar modern styles. It's taken us quite a long time to evaluate those reconstruction era places and buildings, especially when what we see now is drab stained grey concrete. When they were new, they were much more colourful and lively spaces. And I think really what needs to change is planning's attitude to strict land use zoning, which is what happened in those 1940s plans. If there isn't going to be so much retail in the city core, we do need something else, maybe housing, to use the vacant buildings and sites. We probably need to be more flexible in how we adapt for the future. So Peter, what are your own reflections on the rebuilding? Are there any comparisons to other cities that can be made? Quite varied actually, when you start walking around and looking at it now and seeing how it works. The precinct as a shopping centre, originally a pedestrianised centre, probably wasn't a world first, but it certainly was a very early and very carefully thought out example of a city centre, shopping centre. And that's something that I think is a still a valuable thing. But if the retail isn't going to be there, what do we use it for? Recently, in the last three or four years, there's been conflict over decisions to list examples of that post-war reconstruction. And some local politicians have reacted very strongly against this. But I think Coventry is a great national and international example. We ought really carefully to consider retaining the best examples. And I think that's what is being done here. Far from heritage protection threatening urban economies, as those local politicians said, in the longer term, it usually improves them. And as I said, post COVID, we might need to look for a different sort of city centre economy anyway. I think in looking at it, I'd agree with the architectural historian Jeremy Gould and his assessment of that rebuilt city centre is that the planners and architects gave Coventry a world famous plan with some fine buildings and spaces. They have unique historical significance. What Coventry needs, he said, is sensitive, informed and imaginative planning so that we can manage those places. We can continue the life, use and enjoyment of that remarkable place. And if we think about it in that way, there's probably some parallel with how Lisbon rebuilt after its massive earthquake in 1755, because that rebuilt city centre is still very recognisable as the historic city centre of Lisbon, but it's been adapted for many modern requirements. And finally, I'd say, well, Coventry is one of the very few places to have a public plaque to a planner. Although, of course, Sir Donald Gibson wasn't actually a qualified member of the Royal Town Planning Institute, but he did become president of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Thank you very much, Peter. That's been a really useful insight into town planning immediately post-war and how this relates to the present day. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you all for joining us for this first episode of our new series. We hope you found that as interesting and thought provoking as we did. If you would like to learn more about Coventry and the impact of World War II on the city, there is a list of further reading on the RTPI West Midlands International Group web page that you may be interested in. Make sure you keep a lookout for our next video in which we'll be discussing Barcelona. We'll be releasing a new video every month at www.rtpi.org.uk slash WM International Group. And follow us on Twitter at RTPI West Mids to be notified when we release the next video. Thank you ever so much and goodbye.